he's coming up. Okay, I got a wicked moose hunting story that I remembered uh, last week when I was over at my buddy's place when I just did that road trip. And uh, it's funny, like I said earlier, there's so many stories you forget about. I mean, there's so many, there's so many. <laughs> and you carry along with life and you get busy with everything. And uh, and you just forget about them until until you get around the right crew of the right people and you have a few beers or coffee or something and the, the, the BS is just flowing and it just takes you back memory lane and you remember them. I remember this one, this is a great one. Um, this is about a guy, his name was Stet Edmonds. And he was a wildlife biologist from the US and he lived in Taos, is there Taos or Taos, New Mexico? T-A-O-S. And um, he went, he worked on a bunch of, you know, those billionaire, billionaires that owned huge, huge ranches and he, they would hire him to go and, and help get the quality of their elk up in antler and body, in antler size and stuff and manage the quality of the herd. And uh, he knew a lot of people. He was a wealth of knowledge. And he also knew that guy named Colorado Buck or whatever real well. Called him Bucky all the time. Wanted me to come down and meet him or something. And uh, so some of you just might know who this guy was. He's passed away now, rest his soul. And uh, he's a real funny character too. And uh, he was, I remember he was so excited to be hunting with us. He was so excited because at that time, that outfit, you know, it's like a three year waiting list to come with us. It was a very renowned, unbelievably high quality place in the northeastern Rockies of British Columbia. So his life, this is it, this is his last hunt. And this is the second time he'd been hunting up, up, up there in BC. And the first time was years ago. And uh, his actually, his knowledge changed my hunting. Absolutely, you know, the knowledge that he passed on to me during those 14 days or 10 days or whatever it was, and it was very invaluable. He was a very funny guy, and we threw a lot of shit at each other, him and his partner. Uh, pretty comical times. It was, uh, it was good times, but his, he wanted the great moose. He called it the great moose. He wanted a big bull moose, and I love it when somebody wants, actually, I love it when somebody wants a huge anything, because I like Myself, it doesn't matter the species, I like to go and get the oldest, most mature, past his prime animal we can find that's already, you know, uh, spread his genes around, lived his life, and he's good to go to, to come home, sustain us, you know, and uh, create those memories as well. But anyway, moving along. So before Stet's hunt, I had a bow hunter, and it was, his name was Butch. I forget his last name. A lot of people out there all know these guys from California. It was Butch. And Dave Kolkoff, and this Dave Kolkoff guy, who's a funny guy. Those are other stories I can share for later. They're both bow hunters. And I had had this monster, big, big record book bull on ice, so to speak, because I, a few hunts before that, I'd seen this big bull with a bunch of cows in this basin. It's about a two and a half hour horseback ride from camp. And he's up in these mountains, up in this sporadic, you just burn spruce and buck brush holes in this big, uh, hidden basin, surrounded by mountain peaks. And uh, it's just a classic wicked place to see and hunt game. And uh, the man that I had in there when I spotted this bull the first time, he didn't have a moose tag. But I took note of that huge bull that was in there because hopefully he, he should be somewhere around there throughout the fall and I might get a hunter and get a crack at him later on. So later on, sure enough, we had those two bull hunters coming to camp and I had the guy named Butch. And, and right away I'm thinking, okay, let's go get this moose, right? So we, well, we, we tried for a couple other spots a little closer first, I think, or later. I don't know, I forget, whatever, because we had some other mishaps I can share another, another time with that hunt with a big bull. Anyway, um, so we went up, up into this basin and hunted it properly, sat there, glass, 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 called, 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 didn't see a thing. And I just knew this bull's, oh, there's no way this bull isn't in here. There's no way he's not in here. He had way too many cows. He's way too big, and I know he can hear me right now. And what I do is, especially when you're mountain hunting, if they're not gonna be receptive to calling, they're not gonna call back, and they're not gonna be really moving, start climbing. You just get up as high as you can, because I'll tell you what, you got those moose with those great big massive paddles, they can't hide them from you. If you can get up, if you got the right hills around you, you go and climb and, and, and do whatever it takes to get up there. If you gotta ride your horse all the way around, this way for an additional hour and a half or whatever, and then hike up, you do it, right? Because that's how you, that's how you do it. That's how you get it done. 
So I was buying this big, huge, um, tall peak, and I told Butchie, I go, okay, man, we're gonna go, we're gonna go right up there and heck up the top of that thing, and we're gonna look down on this whole area and find them. So we rode all the way up, this hell getting up there, tied up, hiked all the way to the top of this peak, and just peeked over the, and looked, started looking straight down, glassing over the place. And it's amazing how, how much game and things you see when you do that. It's pretty interesting. It's kind of cool. It's fun. And I'm up there, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. And it didn't take me probably 10 minutes. Bam, there he is. <laughs> and he'd gone up out of that basin over the top of this sharp pass. And then he dropped back down to another basin, which that basin drained out into our main river. But the, the, the mouth of that drain was miles farther down river from where our main camp was up river. And I didn't care because if we did manage to harvest them in the basin, we'd just harvest them and then I'd butcher them all up, get them ready to pack out, and then I'd go get the wrangle the next day in a chainsaw, and I would ride all the way down there and cut my way into that drain, pack them up, and ride out. No issue, I don't care. We'll do it, let's just get them. So then uh, we're all excited, he's just laying there. So we rode all the way back down, you know, it took us a couple more hours to get all the way back, and then we hiked all the way up to that pass on foot and got up to the lip, and we're looking down there, dead silent. I'm looking, looking, I took this one big old cottonwood as my marker to where he was. And I'm calling, so just very, very gingerly, just told a little bit of calls, a little bit of cow call, a little bit of subtle bull calling, because you know he's in there with cows. And you want to kind of sucker him to get up and come and kick your ass, but I know he'd also been with a pile of cows in there for some time now, and I've watched them before. All those bulls do is fight off bulls all day long every day. So he's probably getting a little worn out. He probably got pushed up and over the height of land, and he's trying to hide out in there and not get any fights anymore. So he's not responding. And I'm looking down there, I'm looking, I just can't spot. I'm like, he's got to be right there, right by that root ball. And I kept looking by this damn root ball, close to the base of that big cotton when I was using my marker, and I couldn't figure out where he was. <laughs> and finally, I'm looking at my binoculars, and the root ball moved. And it was his frickin' massive brow tines I was looking at, thinking it was a root ball on edge. So now it's game on, and uh, still I couldn't get him. Now I can see him. I can see his reactions to my calling. It's not doing anything. And Butch couldn't get down there. There's no way he could have snuck down there. We're in a wall of buck brush between us and all around him, and there's no way he could have he could have stalked in on him with his recurve. So uh, I was trying to talk. I go, just use my rifle and dummy this thing, man. The thing is freaking huge. It's huge. Just dump him. And he's like, no, why would I do that? You know. I'm like, okay. So. Uh, we carried on and we went back in there and tried again a couple times, couldn't find him, didn't happen, nothing's calling. And we carried on with that hunt and did, we finished off that hunt in some other areas. So moving along. My main story is about this particular moose. So my next hunt, now I, I know I got a guy with a rifle coming and I just hope that he can hike. Cause you know, a lot of times we'll get guys, some seniors, that are busted up, they can't hardly move or anything, and it's all you can do just to get them to where some game is, let alone riding them for two and a half hours down the valley, mountain riding them up another hour, and then make them climb to the top of a mountain and into the next basin. And I'm just hoping I'm gonna get a guy that's physically capable, because I wanted that moose bad. I wanted that moose real bad. So here's Stet. And Stet, you know, his knees were killing him. He wasn't so good uh, much of a hiker anymore. And, uh, he really loved his Glenn Fittick and his cigars, <laughs> which is, it was funny because uh, he was just such a good guy and a comedian. And, uh, and uh, he goes, this is my signature. This is my signature, my, my cigar. You know, always had a cigar in the go. And uh, we were bugging the shit out of him. He'd never go have a shower and shower day. <laughs> he never brush his teeth. And uh, I was, I just tore him at the living crap out of him all the time, back and forth. But it was all friendly, good, fun banter. Like I remember, you know, I remember the specifically one time in the cabin, you know, it's, it's pitch black in this one room cabin I share with hunters and you can't hear a thing in there and everybody's breathing. And all of a sudden it's pitch black. I'm not, I'm wide awake yet. And all of a sudden I hear this, the sound of a bottle on wood, you know, duk, 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 duk. and they hear the, the cap going off the cap of the bottle of Glenfiddich and they hear this. And then he puts it back and then I just out of the quiet dark side go, you loser. And then he go, go after yourself. You know, it was pretty funny. So I took Stat to a few different spots, hoping I might find him a monster moose, and I wasn't finding one. And finally I said to him, I go, look, I know where there's a huge bull, 
and but it's going to be a it's going to be hard on you to get to get you to him and it's not going to be that easy and uh, i was kind of saving him hoping i might be able to pull this off because obviously if i took you to this place it would beat the living crap out of you really really bad and then it might ruin the rest of your days of your hunt especially if it doesn't work out and it's a bit of a risk and so for all you know when you're guiding that is a risk factor that a good guide should think about is your physical capabilities as your hunter and exactly what you're going to do to him in the first few days of his hunt, especially if it's two weeks long. You don't want to ruin their time and physically annihilate them, you know, the first couple days to the point where he can't hike anymore, or doesn't want to, and you just don't want to do that. So, uh, Stet's game. You know, he's been out a handful of times. We've been out a few into a few different places so far. We haven't seen the great moose that he, uh, he called you know, and uh, want it so badly. And he's like, okay, let's do this. I'm like, okay, let's go, let's get this miss. And I am so stoked, because I'm 100% I'm confident I'm gonna find this bull, right? And he's got a 270, he knows how to hunt, he knows how to shoot. So here's the funny part. So the whole time I'm stressing about this long two and a half hour ride down river, and then another hour and a bit riding up into this huge basin, and then sitting and glassing and hunting all day long, and then riding him all the way back. You know, it's hard on him. It's not a fun place to go for a day hunt way down there. And uh, you're always hoping you're making the right decision. And uh, you just hope this is going to work out on and on, right? So another thing, uh, I got to back up a little bit. So whenever I'm guiding or hunting with anybody, if I'm guiding anybody to anything, um, one thing that I tell everybody right off the bat is if we are ever, whatever, if we're riding, if we're walking, hiking, if you ever see me looking at you going like this, the only thing that means and will ever mean is get over here as fast as you can and shoot this. That's what that means. And I, and I ingrain that in them because you wouldn't believe how many times I've done that. And, and it's all, every second counts because what it means is you're something standing there looking at me. It's what we're after and you got to get over here and shoot it quick. Hurry, 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 hurry. And because uh, you wouldn't believe how many times I've done that and guys just look at me. Oh, what you see something <laughs> and they don't come running over and the time they were trying to talk to me was the time they needed to get to me to shoot it and then it's gone i know this from experience so if i ever go like this run run <laughs> run to me as fast as you can and shoot this monster whatever it is i'm looking at so we're riding down the high i call it the highway trail because it's our main trail in and out of camp and it's the main trail we take when we ride the highway at the end of the fall or sometimes between hunt changes when the bush plane can't get them in and uh I'm, we're riding down the trail and i'm i'm fully concerned and stressed about what i'm doing to poor stat today like i'm basically going to physically destroy him today so you can imagine i'm stressing out thinking oh man please let this moose be there you know please let this thing be there. i mean that's i've been aware of this bull now for over three weeks you know, it's a long time for hammer bull moose to stay anywhere in one spot that long. Those things are typically nomads. They'll come in, they cruise nonstop, and they just set up and dump their antlers uh, late season wherever they finish rutting. They don't, I rarely see the same moose each year. Very, very rarely. I think maybe once I did. But anyway, so the stress of these things moving on is huge, right? I mean, those huge bulls, they, they don't typically hold all those cows for very long because all those cows, all that scent, all that action, it's just attracting more bulls. Attracting more bulls nonstop. Other nomadic bulls that are nonstop on, on uh, tour. And they all try the big bull. Doesn't matter what time of day or night, they all try him. He's got to fight every single day and try to keep, keep, uh, around, keep himself surrounded by all those cows. So the chances of this guy not being there are pretty high too, right? So, uh, so we just start riding down the trail. And I come around the corner and all of a sudden here is this great big hammer record book, record book moose standing right there in the middle of the trail with one cow looking at me at about, I don't know, 40 yards. And it's a real tight, tight draw. Like the creek bed, the creek itself is only, I don't know, 15 yards across. You know, it's only that deep, and then uh, the, the mountains go straight up, straight up on either side of this particular pass through, right? I'm like, holy shit. And the moose, automatically the moose busts across the creek and he starts running up the side of the, the mountain in that stunted spruce. I turn around and I'm going like this. So if you guys are on, 
I turn around on my horse, I'm like, get over, get over, get over, get over here, get over here. And here's stats like this, he's on his horse with a cigar. I'll never forget the look, so I looked back and all I saw was this. And he goes like this, right? I'm already off my horse, I'm like, get over here, get over here. And he's like, huh? So he gets off his horse, basically lets go, he pulls his rifle out of his scabbard, and he's running towards him, going like this, and he's not even looking at his feet, hits a log, boom! Down he goes, does a face plant in the trail, right? I'm like, oh my god. Then the moose goes trotting up a little farther again, and I'm calling at the moose. And he stops. And all you can see is his, his hump and his shoulder and a bit of his hind quarter on an angle like this, like angle like that, as he's standing there. And his head and all of his gears behind two trees. So, uh, Stet comes up and I'm going, and I can still say, I go, shoot that moose, shoot that moose, shoot that moose behind the shoulder, hurry, shoot that moose right there, just shoot it. And he's looking at me, are you sure? Are you, are you sure? Shoot that moose, shoot it. Because <laughs> like I tell everybody, with any, with any species of deer, moose, or bear, or anything, when it's an absolute hammer monster, or as a lot of hunters are familiar with, if it's a Boone and Crockett class animal, you're, you regist it registers in your head in about a quarter of a second. It's If you ever have to look at a game animal, wonder if it's a monster, wonder if it's kind of big, it's not. It just isn't. Because when you see a true hammer goliath of anything, you know the second you glance at it, it's like, oh my goodness, that's the reaction. And that's what this moose was. And I only had it. I didn't really get a chance to look at him. I saw his huge three and three brow tines on him. And then he bolted up the hill. So, I mean, he only had to take, take two steps and he was gone forever. <laughs> gone. And uh, Stet comes up, boom, pulls the trigger, drilled it. And then uh, the moose, he didn't even know what he shot. <laughs> kind of sad, but whatever. So he shoots the moose. And the thing starts falling down that falling down the steep slope in the spruce. You can see by the treetops, the spruce tops, bang, 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 bang. You know, you can see the the treetops getting mowed over all the way down as it's tumbling down the slope. And then uh, and then it finally stops. And I'm like, yes! Yes! And I'm high five of him. He's like, are you sure it's a legal one? And I'm like, are you sure it's a big one? I'm like, dude, you just shot a freaking monster. You just shot a monster. So, uh, now here's the there's the crazy part. So we his horse kind of took off a little bit. I had to go run back there and catch his horse, and then I got the horses all tied up. And uh, we went hiking up up into the woods, up hiking up the slope there. And if it wasn't the bull that I had been obsessing of for almost a month, and it was the bull that we we're about to go absolutely annihilate, poor debt down the valley and up into the big basin and up and climb up and over and hopefully get him out of there. And if we shot him in there, I'd have to get the wrangle the next day and ride all the way down the river all day long, ride up, cut your way in, get him and stay overnight and get him out. You know, it was gonna, it was fixing to be one hell of an episode. And it was the exact bull that I was after, laying there dead at our feet. And it was 15 minutes from the cabin. Oh my god, that was awesome. You know, hopefully, I don't know, maybe the, the story won't sound that great. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But uh, when I look back and remember that experience, it was uh, it was crazy. For me, it was crazy because at the time I was so passionate about it. I still am, but I wanted that particular moose so bad and tried for him for so long. And uh, everything was just against, against, against it working out. And now I got this guy who could barely hike anymore, and uh, his knees killed him riding, kind of hurt him a lot, and it was, I was about to roll the dice and uh, basically annihilate the rest of his hunt today, <laughs> physically. And, and uh, there was a gift, from, a gift from God right there. He, he delivered that bull right into her lap and into, into Stet's uh, living room, and, and it was a big... It was just a very, very happy day for him and everybody involved. It was pretty cool. And uh, he sent me photographs later on of the moose, and he actually wrote a story for it. I don't remember what magazine he, he put it in. I do have the two pages, though. I had them photocopied and emailed to me years ago, and I still have them. And uh, poor Stet passed away now, but um, it was definitely an honor to hunt with him, and I learned so much from him. I'll share it later in another story, possibly, but uh, yeah. That was one hell of a uh, experience and one hell of a memory and a hunt for me and uh, and for Stud as well. 
<laughs> that was, was awesome. Obviously, I'm still laughing about it now. I'm st still giggling about it like a like a Boy Scout and uh, how it all worked out. But there you go. There is another hunt story for you. <laughs>